Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, I'm having a very hard time getting started the past few days, and I psyched myself out, and then I don't pick anything. And I So we're doing a video right now. Sit down. Why the Merlin engine was essential to the war. Let's learn. Welcome to airspace here at Imperial War Museum, Duxford. A regular conversation for the last 80 years, from anything from Parliament to a pub, is what couldn't we have won the war without? Couldn't we have won the war without a Spitfire or a Hurricane? Could we have won the war without a Lancaster or a Mosquito or a Mustang? But one thing that surely has to go into that equation and that conversation is something that all those aeroplanes I've just said have in common. The Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. A lot of people remember the Merlin engine for the famous aeroplanes, the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the Mustang, the Lancaster. The Merlin was also used in aeroplanes like the Ferry Battle and the Bolton Paul Defiant. But in all its production life, over 50 different development types of the Merlin were produced. From the initial just over a thousand horsepower to right at the end of the war and a beautiful aeroplane, the de Havilland Hornet, with a two-speed, two-stage and intercooled supercharged Merlin engine giving 2,050 horsepower. Eight. Guys, if you are not new to me, then you know when it comes to engines and cars and stuff, I know less than a toddler. Um, so might have a lot of questions. My main goal to these videos is of course, not to be too annoying with the pausing, but is to learn. And so just a heads up, I am going to have some questions. Merlin engine giving 2,050 horsepower each two of them. Okay. Rolls-Royce have made a lot of very successful aero engines. So the entire point of the engine is to spin this thing really fast. Some not so successful in the Peregrine and the Vulture. Some more successful in the Kestrel and the Merlin. The Kestrel? Rolls-Royce developed the engine from 1933 from an engine right? called the PV-12. Initially of about 900 to 990 horsepower on the bench, then in full production once made reliable in the Mark 1 Spitfire and the Hurricane with over 1100 horsepower. The Merlin engine is a small engine. I won't say it's the Mini A series of the aviation world. It's 27 liters. For our friends across the pond, that's about 1,650, just less, cubic inches. Against the Daimler-Benz 601 from Germany at 39 litres, and the BMW 801 series in the Focke-Wulf 190 at 42 litres, it's a very compact, small little engine. So with the help of the 100-octane fuel developed in the USA at the time, this little Merlin engine was fantastic for development. What about the Merlin engine? What, what was your opinion about that? Well, that was that was a marvelous. Uh, that was a that was a wonderful piece of machinery. There's no doubt about it. It was the making of the Spitfire, and it was the making of the uh, the fact that the Rolls Royce went on producing more and more power out of the Merlin. That's what enabled the Spitfire to be developed to, to the extent that it was. Uh, it was uh, a very happy partnership between Rolls Royce and Supermarines. As magnificent as the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine is, it did have a few flaws. Carburetor fed, as I've said in previous videos, a negative G maneuver would result in the carburetor flooding and the engine missing and coughing. Not good in the middle of a dogfight. The header tank for the coolant was right at the front. Initially, the coolant was ethanol glycol, very flammable if it was hit by an incendiary round. Later on, diluted and pressured not so much of a problem, but initially, quite a worry. Question, there actually guys. was a Spitfire that could perform in a negative G dive. Possibly only one, though. The Germans got hold of one or two Spitfires and retrofitted it with the inverted Daimler-Benz engine. With its fuel injection system, that aeroplane was tested and was proved to be quite manoeuvrable. Once a P-51 that became the Mustang had been fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin, the Allison engine, like I've said before, a very good strong engine, but getting a little bit asthmatic at high level. Tested here at the Air Fighting Development Unit, the Mustang fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine became the world-beating aeroplane it was. Of course, in wartime, the production demands were very heavy. 
when the Mustang was developed with the Merlin engine, Rolls-Royce then gave Packard in the United States license to build the Merlin engine and Packard themselves using the American mass production technique between 1942 and 1945 produced over 55,000 Merlin engines. Of course in the wartime in the UK British factories were being bombed most nights so the collaboration was vital. In 1940 a contract was actually offered to Ford of America to build Merlin engines. That So it must have been extremely terrifying to have been uh, obviously extremely terrifying to be a soldier to be a pilot to be a uh, to be in the navy okay but in terms of working at on at home in the war effort it seems like some sort of uh tank or engine airplane manufacturer worker would have the most um nail biting or just knowing that just knowing that like you being a factory worker, you are in a building that might as well have a giant bullseye on it because that's what the enemy wants to bomb. And so I'd imagine that that's pretty terrifying. And I just want to ask the question, does it go for... My, my main question... So I'm about... I'm at uh, 437. If you want to go forward to when I restart, uh, just go ahead. Okay, you're dead to me. Um, but in terms... So 437 is where I'm at. What confuses me about an engine... Good to nine is so 33 from an engine called the pv12 so initially so, of about 900 right here so 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 the thing is is that you are you are uh there's fuel in the engine and all these have little explosions in them that make the piston go back up and so the uh, the point of the engine is to make these pistons go up and down all of them in order to continuously twist the front propeller right like that's the whole point is to move the propeller and everything in it is to do that but how do they get all of these pistons so in sync and in that none of them falter to, to being not in sync and, and that I'd, I'd imagine would have a really bad effect on the engine and so i'm wondering you know all of these little things going you know what i mean um how they get that so in sync into in so that they can make the propeller turn at a constant rate that's what boggles my mind about about airplane engine or any engine it's just how do you get a constant controllable spin of your propeller or in a car your wheel or anything into being so precise that's that's what i wonder so where are we for for something Production to the Merlin Rolls in British factories were in 1940. A contract was actually offered to Ford of America to build Merlin engines towards L in Nigeria. Okay, sorry, I'm the fifth we're, we're around here. Okay, so I'm Merlin engine I'm, and Packard themselves using the American mass production technique between 1942 and 1945 produced over 55,000 Merlin engines. Of course, in the wartime in the UK. British factories were being bombed most nights. So the collaboration was vital. In 1940, a contract was actually offered to Ford of America to build Merlin engines. Initially, that was taken on. But controversially, towards the end, Henry Ford himself actually pulled the plug, not wanting to send or sell materials to any foreign power involved in a conflict. Despite this decision in 1940, by the end of looks like a Gatling gun wasn't uh Henry Ford sort of um you know not so anti Germany of the war Ford in Trafford in Manchester were employing 17,000 people involved in making Merlin engines now Rolls Royce never have been involved in mass production but the Packard Motor Company, of course, was brilliant at it. They were built in America and then flown over here. I understand that one of the first things that was done at the beginning of the war was that a complete set of Rolls-Royce Merlin engine drawings was sent over to America, just in case anything did happen back here. 
But one one difference between a, a Packard engine and a, a Derby engine, as we used to say, is that the Packard engine was all polished up and, and they got chrome plated nuts and bolts on, whereas we were struggling with cadmium plate, etc. Rolls Royce Merlin engines are among the power units for Spitfires, Hurricanes, and Defiance. As there are no fewer than 80 types of British warplanes and 30 American types, the great variety of aircraft stores is easily understood. 80 types? By late 1942, mid-1943, Merlin engines were powering some of the most magnificent aeroplanes. 80 types? I mean, what, you need, like, transportation aircraft, you need bomber aircraft, you need fighter aircraft. 80? Of the Second World War. Without the supercharging... Sorry, I, I gotta shut up. ...magnificent aeroplanes of the Second World War. Without the supercharging, as a Meteor engine, the engine was even powering tanks. By the middle of the war, the demand for this magnificent engine was huge. Obviously being now produced both sides of the Atlantic, Rolls-Royce in England, Ford and Trafford, Packard in the United States. Well, by the end of the war, I personally was in charge of a test bench. Bench testing, Merlin 66s and Merlin 72s that produced 1875 horsepower. The same engine, but boosted up uh, with, with two-stage supercharging, with intercooling. In other words, it used to cut, the air used to be pressured by the superchargers to such a degree that it used to get too hot, and of course the air expands when it's hot, so you had less oxygen getting into the cylinders, so it was a self-defeating exercise. So they had to have huge intercoolers built all around the air ducts pumping into the engine with radiators filled with uh, ethylene glycol to cool the air down in the engines to get the power. Of course, in the war... I have to pee so bad, guys. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. I washed my hands. Cool the air, pumping into the engine with radiators filled with uh, ethylene glycol to cool the air down in the engines to get the power. Of course, in the wartime, over on the other side in Germany, the development of the Daimler-Benz 601 series was moving from the 601 all the way through to the 605 and also nearly doubling in power as well. Powering from the Messerschmitt 109E through the F, then the G model, then the K model. Obviously by the end of the war, with the continued Allied bombing from the Royal Air Force at night, the United States in the day, the production from Daimler-Benz was getting more and more difficult and moving from factories to underground catacombs and caves, employing slave laborers from concentration camps. Therefore, the initial quality towards the end was not there. The development of the Merlin continued improving all the way through the war from a thousand horsepower, a little bit less on the bench, a little bit more in first production, all the way including 1350 for a Mark V Spitfire, 1650 to 1700 in a Mark IX and a Mark VIII Spitfire, and a P51D, all the way up to 2050 horsepower in the de Havilland Hornet, which was built too late to see action, but was initially going to be made for taking on the Zeros in the Pacific War. Of course, the nuclear bomb happened, and Hornets didn't get their chance for service. But with 2,050 horsepower, Merlins each with a two-speed... That would be a very interesting uh, alternate history that's not, like, too crazy, that has, like, you know, decades implications. I mean, it would, but just, like, how would World War II have played out the ending since the... Uh, if the atomic bomb... If the Manhattan Project was never successful, you know? They never made an atomic bomb. Two states, but with 2005. I'm assuming it would be a joint, like, Soviet British American invasion of, of Japan, and. Um, yeah, so. Hornets didn't get their chance for service. But with 2,050 horsepower, Merlins each with a two speed, two stage supercharger, a Hornet was just about the fastest production piston engine fighter ever made. Unfortunately, unless anybody can uh, know different, I don't know of a whole Hornet anywhere in existence today. What, in, with all the types you've flown, have you consider was the nicest aircraft, the one that gave you the most pleasure? I've often thought of this. I would say, without any question in my mind, the de Havilland Hornet. It was 
a beautiful, instinctively beautiful shape, and it just looked right. It has that rare quality, which so often is missing in aircraft. It was overpowered. This was delightful. To okay. such an extent that um, I used to give aerobatic shows uh, in this aircraft the, and do the whole show on one engine and eventually do a loop with both feathered. It was that type of airplane. It was very, very streamlined, very, very fast. This does look like a futuristic looking aircraft, like if you were in the 1940s kind of looking at this. And if you dived it down, obviously at full power, just before you pull up your feather, and you have enough inertia there to carry you right through the loop with no problem at all. But it was that type of airplane, delightful. By 1943, at about 1,650 to 1,700 horsepower in the Mark 9, the Mark 16, the Mark 8 Spitfire and the P-51 was getting around about at the time towards the end of its development for that year. So Rolls-Royce took on the old Griffin engine, which at 36.9 litres is a good 10 litres bigger than the Merlin. Initially put in the Mark 12 Spitfire and then more totally in the Mark 14, 18 and the 20 series right at the end and after the wartime. With 2,050 horsepower, a big five blade propeller and a crank turning the opposite way to the Merlin engine. So the Spitfires with that engine had a huge tail to counteract the torque and the torque swing when taking off. I have been here, funnily enough, uh, worked for the Imperial War Museum at Duxford 20 years today. And no matter how many times I hear a Merlin engine, I am never bored or find it complacent. To me, it is the most beautiful sounding engine of all time. By the end of the war, over 150,000 of these magnificent engines have been made. And the contribution of this engine to the war effort and to the final victory of the Allies cannot be understated. Great video. And guys, so this, so I've asked this a few times, but I, I, it just, it's, it's kind of amazing to me. So the propeller on any propeller aircraft, right, works the exact same way as a propeller on a ship, right? Like when a ship is going in reverse, what is powering that ship going backwards is the same exact concept, just in a different medium from water to air, as a airplane being driven forward in the air, right? And that 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 uh, will not stop being crazy to me. Anyways, I uh, hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, if you could teach me, uh, answer my questions, teach me something in the comments, I'd really appreciate it. And I will see you guys next time. All right. Bye, guys.